Well, just like how my dad says, time to watch a TV show that can make me laugh. Wait, this one's quite interesting. A few days later. <laughs> Looks like I'm already enjoying it. Hey Junior. Hey Koopa, what brings you here? Oh, I'm going to show you a short film. A short film? Really? Can we watch together? Yeah, we're friends. We can watch it together. This short film is based on the Michael Crichton's novel Jurassic Park, Chapter 32, titled Netri, narrated by Mirza the Teenage Boy. The sign said, Electrified fence, 10,000 volts, do not touch, but Netri opened it with his bare hands to unlock the gate, swinging it wide. He went back to the jeep, threw through the gate, and then walked back to close it behind him. Now he was at the park itself, no more than a mile from the east dock. He stepped on the accelerator and hunched forward over the steering wheel, peering through the rain-slashed windshield as he drove the jeep round the narrow road. He was driving fast, too fast, but he had to keep on his timetable. He was surrounded by all sides of black jungle. But soon he should be able to see the beach in the ocean off to his left. This damn storm, he thought, might screw up everything because if Dachshund's boat wasn't waiting for him at the east dock when Nedry got there, the whole plan would be ruined. Nedry couldn't wait very long and he'd be missed back at the control room. The whole idea behind the plan was that he could drive to the east dock, drop off the embryos and be back in a few minutes before anyone noticed. It was a good, good plan, a clever plan. Nedry had worked on it so carefully, refining every detail. This plan was going to make him a million and a half dollars, 1.5 make. That was 10 years worth of income in a single tax-free shot, and it was going to change his life. <laughs> Nedry had been damned carefully, even to the point of making Dachshund meet him at the San Francisco airport at the last minute with an excuse about wanting to see the money. Actually, Nedry wanted to record his conversation with Dawson and mention him by name on the tape just so that Dawson wouldn't forget he owed the rest of the money. Nedry was including a copy of the tape with the embryos. In short, Nedry had thought of everything, except this damn storm. Something dashed across the road in a white flash in his headlights. It looked like a large rat that scurried in the underbrush, dragging a fat tail. Possum? Amazing that a possum could survive here. Do you think the dinosaurs could an get an, an animal like that? Where was the damn dog? He was driving fast and he'd already been gone five minutes. He should have reached the east dock by now. Had he had taken a wrong turn? He didn't think so. He hadn't seen any forks in the road at all. Then where was the dock? He thought. It was a shock when he came around the corner and saw that the road terminated in a grey concrete barrier six feet tall and streaked dark with rain. He slammed on the brakes in the jeep, fish tailed, losing traction in an end-to-end -end spin, and for a horrified moment he, was, he thought he was going to smash into the barrier. He knew he was going to smash and he spun the wheel frantically and the, the jeep slid to a stop. The head lands just a foot away from the concrete wall, paused there listening to the rhythmic flick of the wipers. Nedry took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. He looked back down the road. It obviously had taken a wrong turn somewhere. He could retrace his steps, but that would take too long. He'd better find out where the hell he was. He got out of the jeep, feeling happy, heavy raindrops spattered on his head. It was a real tropical storm, all right, raining so hard that it hurt. He glanced at his watch, clicking the button to eliminate the digital dial. Six minutes gone. Where the hell was he? He walked around the concrete barrier, and on the other side, along the rain, heard the sound of gurgling water. Could it be the ocean? Nedry hurried forward, 
his eyes adjusting to the darkness as he went, dense jungle on all sides, raindrops slapping on the leaves. The gurgling sound became louder, drawing him forward, and then suddenly he came out of the foliage and felt his feet sink in the soft earth and saw the dark currents of the river. The river? He was at the jungle river? Damn! At the river where? The river ran for miles through the island. Then he looked at his watch again. Seven minutes gone. You have a problem, Dennis, he said aloud. As if in reply, there was a soft, hooting cry of an owl in the forest. Nedry hardly noticed. He was worrying about his plan. The plain fact that he was that time had run out. There wasn't a choice anymore. He had to abandon his original plan. All that he could do was go back to the control room, store the computer, and somehow try to contact Dachshund so, th so he could set up the drop at the east dock for the following night. Nedry would have to scramble to make that work, but he thought he could pull it off. The computer automatically locked all calls, so after Nedry got through Dachshund, he had to go back in the computer and erase the record to the, of the call. But one thing was sure, he couldn't stay out in the park any longer or his absence would definitely be noticed. Nedry started back, heading forward the, above the car's headlights. He was drenched and miserable. And then he heard a soft, hooting cry once more. And this time, he paused. That hadn't really sounded like an owl, and it seemed to be close by in the jungle, somewhere off to his right. As he listened, he heard a crashing sound in the underbrush, in silence. He waited and heard it again. It sounded distinctly like something big and slow to the jungle toward him. Something big, something near. A big dinosaur. Get out of here in his own thoughts. Nedry began to run. He made a lot of noise as he ran, but even so, he could hear the animal crashing through the foliage behind him and waiting for him. It was coming closer. Stumbling over the tree roots in the darkness clawing his way past dripping branches, he saw that the jeep ahead and the light shining through the vertical wall of the barrier made him a little better. In a moment, he'd be in the car, and then he'd get the hell out of here. He scrambled around the barrier, and then Nedry froze. The animal was already there, but it wasn't close. The dinosaur stood 40 feet away at the edge of the illumination from the headlamps. Nedry hadn't taken the door, so he hadn't seen the different types of dinosaurs, but this one was definitely strange looking. The ten-foot-tall body was yellow with black spots, and along the, the head were in a pair of red, V-shaped crests. But still, the dinosaur didn't move, but again it gave a soft, new cry. Nedry paused and, say, and waited to see it would attack. It didn't. Perhaps the headlights from the jeep frightened it, forcing it to keep its distance, like a fire. The dinosaur stared at him, and then snapped its head in a single swift motion. Nedry felt something smacked wetly against his chest. He looked down and saw a dripping glob of foam on his rain-soaked shirt. He touched it curiously, and still not comprehending, but then it clicked. It was spit. The dinosaur had, st had spit on him. It was creepy, he thought. He looked back at the dinosaur and saw, he saw the head snap again and immediately felt another wet smack against his neck, just above the shirt collar. He wiped it away with his hand. Jeez, it was disgusting, he thought. But the skin on his neck was already starting to tingle and burn, and he realized his hand was tingling too. It was almost as if he had been touched with acid. Nedry opened the guard door, glancing back at the dinosaur to make sure it wasn't going to attack. Nedry felt a sudden, excruciating pain in his eyes.
stabbing like spikes through the back of his skull. He squeezed his eyes shut and gasped with the intensity of it and threw up his hands to cover his eyes and felt the slippery foam trickling down both sides of his nose. It was spit. The dinosaur had spit in his eyes. Even as he realized it, the pain overwhelmed him, and he dropped to his knees, disoriented and wheezing. Nedry collapsed onto his side, his cheek pressed to the wet ground, his breath coming in thin whistles through the constant ever-screaming pain that caused flashing spots of light to appear behind his tightly shut eyelids. The earth shook beneath him, and Nedry knew the dinosaur was moving to hear its soft hooting cry, and despite the pain, he forced his eyes open, and still, he saw nothing but splat flashing spots against black. Slowly, realization came to him. He was blind. The hooting had <laughs> was louder as Nedry scrambled to his feet and staggered back against the side panel of the car as a wave of nausea and dizziness swept over him. The dinosaur was close now. He could feel it coming close. He was dimly aware of its snorting breath, but he couldn't see. He couldn't see anything and his terror was extreme. He pressed out his hands, waving them widely in the air to ward off the attack. He knew it was coming. Then there was a new searing pain, like a fiery knife in, the, in his belly, and Nedry stumbled, reaching blindly down to touch the ragged edge of his shirt, and then the thick, slippery mass that was surprisingly warm, and with horror, he knew he was holding his own intestines in his hands. The dinosaur had th torn him open, his guts had fallen out. Nedry fell to the ground and let it on something scaly and cold. It was the animal's foot. And then there was a new pain on both sides of his head. The pain, the pain grew worse as he was slipped on to his feet. He knew the dinosaur had his head in his jaws. And the horror of that realization was followed by one final wish. That it could all be ended soon. So what do you think, Junior? I have nothing to say for the end.